1979, we had the very first workshop in the world on could you really use these little variations in our DNA to uncover the location of the Huntington gene. Because, I mean, you know, we didn't really know what these markers were. You know, we knew they were like patterns like this, you know. But we didn't, and they had homes on chromosomes. And then you had to physically see where it traveled with the gene on a chromosome and with a disease uh, back in the 70s, you know. Uh, and it was like, you know, restriction fragment like polymorphism with daily art. Manya's uh, marker number 12 that he, you know, had carefully crafted. We said, well, can we just use Manya's number 12 and look for the marker? Everybody was like wanting to the blackboard and saying, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. It's going to take ages. No, no way. Even like the people organized it, Way White and David Botstein. First of all, it'll take, you know, a hundred years. I mean, literally, because they said you have to actually find every single marker and find this home on a chromosome. And Ray White and David Botstein said to me, Nancy, if you tell people you're looking for Huntington's, they're going to think it's unethical. Literally. And if I went to Venezuela and tell all these poor people, it's just unethical. Literally. Because it's such a long shot of just giving up their hopes. And David Hausman, who's like a complete genius, a little quiet genius, and David said, well, what if time, you know, every time we actually find a new marker, you just see if it travels with parents of Huntington in a family. So that was, you know, David's insight. We gave David Hausman the very first grant for $6,000 to actually look for a, a marker. But again, a shockingly long shot. And it depends on having gigantic families. So in July of 1979, just like three months before our workshop, I just came back from Venezuela. You know, there are families there. They're a little bit more inbred. Go take a look. So off I went, and they have just these, just, I mean, the, they're called chiladas, and they're, they're out little tiny. We, first, we went in a gigantic diesel that almost crashed on the way down there. It's like six hours to even get from uh, just from Maracaibo, straight down the lake. You have to go, to go. And then we went into a full stilt village in, in, in the middle of Norway. And I slid up to a woman, and she just looked at me in shock. What? Who do you have? You know, this blonde hair, you know, girl <laughs> from California who didn't speak Spanish. And I said, well, you know, I'm Nancy and I'm looking for, you know, these big family. You know, she had 11 kids, but her spouse died. So she said, well, my brother's right over there. And right in the little still village, just the next, you know, row right over, uh, it was a stunningly beautiful man. They clearly had Huntington's, like early Huntington's. So he said, yes, my wife is right over there, and clearly also had Huntington's. So he said, how many kids do you have? She said, well, I had three miscarriages. So he thought, wow, there go the homozygotes, you know, because we didn't know even if you could live being a homozygote. And then she said, and I have 14 living kids, and they're all around her and encircling her. And one of the girls already had a Huntington. And then her brother rode up, and again, stunningly great. And this little boy was actually named Beautiful Angel. And the dad also had early Huntington. And he had uh, nine kids, and he had, we brought with him this little teeny tiny boy. And it turned out that that little boy actually had juvenile Huntington's. We never seen Jeff Huntington's in anybody that young. It was that that little tiny kid, his DNA, by studying his DNA, that we found the marker and the gene. So from the little still village, and then we went back every year. So literally from 1979 until 2002, but our team was still going, 
you know, built a family tree of 1,800 people, 4,000 blood samples, 500 uh, skin fibra, brains, uh, sperm samples. We had a collaboration of over 100 scientists at Francis Collins, a critical member, David Hausman, Jim Guzella, Bob Horvitz, and everybody agreed to collaborate. But still, we were just totally, you know, inventing everything as we went along. One of the most gratifying things to me on the marker, we found the marker, Jim Watson said that our discovery in 1983 helped launch the Human Genome Project. So that was like shining and gratifying, you know, to be part of something that was personally meaningful it could have, you know, incredible ramifications for science worldwide. And everybody really thought it's going to take forever. We were studying a family in Iowa. We thought that one was big enough to actually tell. It wasn't. And it was only when we actually combined the Venezuelans with the Iowans and said, yes, the marker is right there. And we had, you know, large score, which means here's the odds of it not being by chance over like almost a billion to one, you know. Like you don't get that. <laughs> they studied that paper as like how to do, how to really change the world, how to do science. And it was just revolutionary. Finding the gene took a lot longer week than we ever thought it was gonna be. That was a slog. Uh, uh, I think that for, even for the scientists, they thought, wow, they don't even be good. We'd have to collaborate. You know, luckily, everybody sort of got to have, you know, papers along the way where they were first and last authors, so that helped. But the final, you know, here's the gene, was the entire, you know, Huntington's disease collaborative group. You know, 50 authors and all the PIs and Jill Bates, who said, can we just give you the top of chromosome four to start sequencing? Because we know it's up there. And you could find help us find the gene. So uh, it turns out Sulston actually was sequencing the top of chromosome four. That was the very first human sequencing he ever did, which contributed to the Human Genome Project. So <laughs> you know, so who knew? You know? And so he's sequencing away and sequencing away, and sequencing away. Uh, and we were just getting more and more, you know, frustrated and desperate. How long is this going to take? And then, it, but that little kid, you know, with the experiment repeat, he had 120 like CAGs in his DNA. While we were actually looking at his DNA, we discovered the gene. That was the Eureka. So we didn't actually have to use um, Salston sequencing. So we've had fantastic, you know, collaborations and successes. But I think it didn't, none of us thought it would take 10 years now.